back one of the troops. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sherry Bernhaver is joining us. She is a prominent global subject matter expert in the fields of disability and accessibility. She's best known probably for launching digital accessibility network programs at places like McDonald's, Albertsons, Albertsons, ooh, we could share war stories, uh, and VMware. Her most recent contribution to the accessibility field is an open source tool called Crest, which allows users to automate some aspects of the manual accessibility testing. With degrees in computer science, law, and business, uh, she has a 360 degree view of all of the things that, that all the different facets that come together in the kind of work that we do, particularly around accessibility, because both she and her daughter have accessibility requirements of their own. So you can believe it's personal. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sherry, if you'll I'll stop sharing and you can share your screen. I assume everybody can see my screen and can hear me because the captions are coming up, so yay. Um, this presentation, um, I actually gave this presentation uh, the first time uh, coming up five years ago, uh, back when most uh, user research was still being done uh, in, uh, in person. And so uh, I've revamped it for this um, particular talk to include um, other things that you need to think about when you're doing um, user research in, in remote settings. So about me, I am a senior staff accessibility architect. Can't believe you introduced me after you said, hey, Don Norman's coming. <laughs> um, Senior staff uh, is a senior director level position. It's a little bit more important than it sounds. Um, I've been at VMware for four years now, where I do a lot of strategy and innovation and outreach uh, pertaining to our accessibility program. And I also run all of our user research uh, that includes people with disabilities. So... Uh, this talk normally is longer than I have time for. I've left everything in for reference, um, but I will be intentionally skimming through things uh, that you can go back and look at later. Most of the focus is going to be on adjustments that you want to make to traditional user research to make it work better uh, for people with disabilities. My contact info is at the end. I love to answer questions, so just ping me if I don't get to your question or, you know, I didn't cover something that you wanted to cover. Um, so first of all, um, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with this topic, I want to introduce you to something called WCAG. WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's a little bit of a misnomer. It actually covers documentation and mobile apps and software other than stuff that's HTML based. Um, what it is, is it can be a number of different things. It can be a legal and compliance issue, meaning that you may live in or work in a state or doing work uh, for the federal government, for example, where meeting WCAG is the price of entry to admission to sell to a particular government. Um, the focus of WCAG is accessibility. Now, W3C, which is the organization that produces WCAG, has a much broader remit, the World Wide Web Consortium. They put out standards for things like Java and CSS and, um, and all kinds of um, other stuff beyond accessibility. But accessibility is one of the slices in the portfolio. The purpose of WCAG is to make sure that we get the opinions of people with disabilities included in how we want software to work for those of us who use assistive technology. And assistive technology is what sits between the disabled user and the software. So we interact with something and that something interacts with uh, the software. So for example, I might interact with a magnification tool or I might interact with a uh, a screen reader. Screen reader is something that takes a screen and reads it out loud to somebody who's blind. Um, but for the most part, despite the fact that people with disabilities are potentially 20% or more of your user audience, depending on um, you know whether or not your user audience skews older, the older your audience skews, the more likely it is that you're going to have uh, more participants with disabilities. We're actually not a user group that gets targeted very often. And so WCAG helps uh, to try to eliminate that. And it's been adopted by a number of countries uh, as the accessibility standard that's used uh, in the public sector. 
Okay, so I want to give you an example of the difference between accessibility and usability. Um, you know, an example from uh, Safeway was a is a division of Albertsons, and it's the one that I used to work for. And this was a screenshot of the day that I started about four years ago. And yes, it was technically accessible because everything could be reachable from the keyboard. Okay, in reality, uh, the usability was atrocious. It took 58 tab presses to get to the footer um, and 27 swipes if you were working on responsive mobile. And so that's one of the main reasons why it takes people with disabilities on average about five times as long. In this case, it was probably closer to 10 to interact with a form or a web page is because the, the layouts are not set up well to work with our assistive technology. And so we end up having to do things uh, that other people don't have to do uh, in order to get done what we're there to do. Um, and that can be really tedious and time consuming. Obviously, it's a frustrating experience. And so we want to make things not just accessible. We want them to be accessible and usable. So... Um, why why is accessibility important? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, public sector is going to stop buying products that don't achieve WCAG 2.1 level AA compliance. In three years, the European Accessibility Act will take effect, and the German government is actually reserving the right to recall software if it doesn't meet these standards. Uh, so the standards are only getting more and more stringent, and they're getting adopted by more and more countries. You know, Kenya uses uh, WCAG now for their accessibility laws. India uses WCAG for their accessibility laws. So it is really becoming uh, ubiquitous uh, in the public sector. In the U.S., which is a particular litigious society, I know we've got a lot of non-U.S. people here, but we have a lot of employees suing employers, okay? I'm an employer. I go buy software. Software's not accessible. I hire an employee with a disability who can't use it. What happens? Well, if the employee can't get a transfer, can't get a promotion, can't get a good job review because you can't make the software work for them, you're opening yourself up for um, an EEOC or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission complaint from that um, employee. And there have been uh, multiple multi-million dollar awards for employees who have been discriminated against, fired, or been told, no, they can't even come in for an interview over inaccessible software. So that's really important. Finding issues earlier makes them cheaper to fix. Um, you know, we, in software testing, which is where I started off um, many, many years ago, um, we have this thing called the rule of 10. And every uh, phase that you could have fixed something that you didn't, if it gets discovered and fixed in the phase after, it's 10 times more expensive than it was to fix in the previous stage. So it's really important to include accessibility from the beginning, because if all you're doing is waiting until the software's done and then running your usability tests and finding a bunch of accessibility bugs and finding that your users hate it, it's too late to fix things easily and cheaply. You're either going to be releasing it with a boatload of issues that are going to make your customers annoyed, or you're going to have to delay your release while you go back and fix those things. So doing your research up front, as soon as you've got a, a usable prototype, is going to help you identify these issues um, and fix them sooner, which is going to be better for everybody. Um, Re reducing time on repetitive tasks is going to make a competitive advantage. So if I have a grocery store that makes me swipe 27 times to get to a product that I want to put it in my shopping cart, or I have one that has a type ahead interface that allows me to type four characters, pick something off a list and put it in my shopping cart, guess which one I'm going to use, right? It's going to be the one that's, that's easier uh, for me. Nobody wants to spend four hours building out a shopping cart online um, that uh, you know they then have to go send somebody to the store to pick up for them. Less friction obviously converts to a higher conversion process for um, for customers. You know, some people will just give up and leave without even complaining. You never knew they were there, but you're going to see it in your bounce rates because what's going to happen is people will come in, they'll mess around on the web page for the, a little bit, then they're going, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'm going to go buy those shoes somewhere else. 
Um, and then obviously, 20% of the population is a large number of people. Um, and so when you address disability related issues, you're expanding your potential customer base. And there are certain um, industries where people with disabilities are way more prevalent. Um, for example, healthcare is going to be something where you're going to see more people with disabilities. Uh, senior homes, uh, you're going to see more people with disabilities. Uh, surprisingly, uh, pet stores. Um, lots of people with disabilities have service animals. One of the purchasing segments that they over-index in is uh, pet-related items. So these are just a few areas where you're going to see lots and lots of people with disabilities, and you really do need to take care of them. So what we want to do is very similar to any type of other uh, user research is you want to make sure that you shape your questions in an open-ended manner so that you uh, ask your users, like, what do you want more of? What are your expectations? What are your motivations? When you come to this website, what would be the first thing you would do? And if you don't have a lot of experience with assistive technology, you might be surprised with the answers. If you ask somebody blind, what's the first thing they go do when they go to a website? You might think, oh, I'm going to go look for a table of contents or a sitemap or something like that. Actually, for most blind users, the first thing they do when they go to a website is they get a header list. So their screen reader will tell them what the sections are on the page so that they can jump exactly to the section that they know that they want to go to and not have to listen to all the stuff get uh, translated uh, from the visual output into the sound output that they need in order to operate it. And then obviously what works, what makes things easier, um, you, you have to be open to the question that you didn't know to ask. Um, I did research once at a previous company that I will not name, uh, and uh, it was about having food delivered. And so at the end, we got to the, you know, do you have any other questions or comments? Um, and our number one takeaway from that research was our customers wanted to be able to play Monopoly. Um, especially for people um, who had vision when they were younger and lost vision as adults, they remembered uh, picking those little tags and, and always hoping for the million dollars or the boat or the college scholarship. Um, even though they knew they weren't going to get it, they still wanted to have that hope. It's like, you know, buying a lottery ticket when Powerball goes over a billion dollars. Um, so, uh, and so we made Monopoly accessible uh, because that's what the users asked for. Um, so it, it's always important uh, not to close off your research just to the topics that you think your users are interested in, but actually find out what they're actually interested in. Okay, um, so the, the fundamental question in accessibility is how does the software interact with the assistive technology? Most people with disabilities, unless they're neurodiverse, Use, use assistive technology. And we want the assistive technology experience to be a good experience and not be a barrier. So what has to happen is what's going on on the screen has to be conveyed exactly through, through, through the assistive technology. If you have a site with a shopping cart and somebody deletes an item from the shopping cart and five things on the screen change, but you've only told the user that one of those things has changed, that's a barrier. You're not giving the user the right information. And so that's going to be a problem. So uh, usually focus uh, when you're working with the people with disabilities is, is on that interaction. So you make sure that you're giving the user enough information that they can operate in an equal manner to a non-disabled user. Sorry, my page down stopped working. Um, so usability core concepts. Um, you know, people with different needs need different interventions. You know, when we look at disabilities under a single umbrella, it's 20%. If you look at any one disability, it's actually a much, much smaller amount. And somebody who with dyslexia doesn't have the same needs as somebody who uses a keyboard or somebody who needs magnification for vision loss. So when you're recruiting, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a few minutes, you need to make sure that you're recruiting a good sample of people with disabilities. What's their online behavior? Do they feel like they can interact with the internet as uh, you know, what we would call a normal user, or we refer to it as, do they experience uh, user normalcy? 
you know, and do they use ICT and how much do they use ICT? So ICT is information and communications technology. Um, it's basically the overarching category for anything interactive on the internet that, that connects to the internet. All right, so this is the TLDR slide. Feel free to take a picture. These are the things that you have to focus on uh, when, you're, when you want to do user research that's focusing on people with disabilities. So first of all, you're going to, they are going to prefer individual interviews over group sessions. And that's especially true for screen reader users because when you have a screen reader user, they're going to have an earbud in and they're going to be listening to what the computer tells them. If you've got six screen readers users in a room together, none of them are going to be able to hear anything you say or anything anybody else says because their attention is going to be split 50% on what the screen reader is telling them and 50% on what's going on around them. So you need to, to make sure that you factor that in uh, when you're deciding how many sessions to run. And that does make it a little bit more expensive, but it's definitely worthwhile. Um, users with disabilities will bring their own hardware. Okay, you just have to accept that at face value. We all have our technology optimized. Uh, our assistive technology is all optimized for the way we want to do things. Okay, I've got a friend, Kevin, who's blind. Uh, he has his speech rate on his phone set to 325%. Okay, he's been blind for more than 20 years. He can listen to it that fast. To me, it sounds like Mickey Mouse, but that's how he's got it configured and that works for him. Uh, so you need to accept that people are gonna bring their own stuff in. You're gonna have to install whatever it is uh, that you're reviewing with them on their devices so that they can use their assistive technology setups to work with their devices. Now, if you've never run your software with that assistive technology before, you might need an assistive technology specialist um, on hot standby. You can get those people from um, Centers for Independent Living, Lighthouse for the Blind. There's a lot of different places that you can find assistive technology specialists. So if for some reason something doesn't quite match up, they can, they can figure it out. It's definitely going to take more time. Whatever amount of time you would normally allocate for this time, type of interview, add 50% to it because you're going to have to set up the your software on their hardware and that takes time and they have to listen to things before they can respond and that's slower. If you're filling out forms, it's going to take them about five times as long uh, to complete a form. And if it's five times as long, that actually means you're doing a good job. That shouldn't be something uh, that you get upset over. If you're, you know, at seven or eight times as long, then maybe you need to look at how your forms are constructed uh, to, to make them a little bit more optimal. You definitely want to separate people with congenital disabilities versus people with acquired disabilities. There is a substantial psychological difference between those two. Okay, my disability and my daughter's disabilities, they're both congenital. We, we don't know any other way than the way we've lived and we've had decades to get used to it and develop compensatory skills. If you had somebody today, anybody on this call, who suddenly had my daughter's level of hearing loss. They went to sleep one day with normal hearing and they woke up next day with, without um, what they considered to be normal hearing. You look at it as I had something and I lost it, right? It's a much different psychological perspective and you've had zero time to get used to it or to learn how to use all of the great tools that can help people out with hearing loss, just as one example. So uh, you want to you, you know, recruit your people with congenital disabilities, recruit your people with acquired disabilities. They might be the same disability, but chances are you're gonna get different answers uh, from each of those individuals. If you're doing in-person research, 30% of people with disabilities don't drive. Uh, you're going to have to deal with some uh, form of transportation or maybe even go to where they are um, in order to do some of those sessions. And then you're going to be exposed um, to some private health information uh, that you need to be super careful to protect. Um, and, and some of it can be a little bit traumatic. Uh, I had one research participant once in a study who lost his vision because he got shot in a drive-by shooting, right? That kind of stuff is, is you know, difficult 
it's difficult for them to talk about. It's difficult for you to hear. And that's another reason why uh, sometimes individual uh, sessions work better, but it's definitely data that you want to be very, very protective of. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the cookbook because I'm known for producing cookbooks on all the different things that you need to do to make your research work for people with disabilities. And um, somebody ping me if I start running uh, long on time. I think I'm okay. I need about another 20 minutes. Okay. Number one, give your personas disabilities. Okay. If you don't have personas, you probably need them. Okay, but if you've got Shauna, who's an IT manager who works in a server center, yeah, give Shauna migraines, give Shauna carpal tunnel. Uh, you know, don't make it so that uh, your your personas have no accessibility needs because then you're not really opening up to the question of how is that software going to work uh, for that individual. So that's that's my first recommendation. Is, is always give your personas disabilities. What disability should you start with? Well, if you're in IT, if you're on the technical side of the world, the very first disability that you should start with is colorblindness. Colorblindness affects six and a half percent of the population, uh, of the IT population, because the IT population is 80% men and colorblindness is largely a male linked trait. Um, and it affects colors, right? Your use of red and green. People are religious about their colors. You want to catch that stuff early. You do not want to be catching that stuff um, at the end of your cycles before you release, because that's really going to create a problem. Um, then look maybe at um, neurodiversity, you know, attention deficit disorder or autism, especially if um, you're, again, working with a population that, that's largely male. That's not to say that women aren't autistic and women aren't dyslexic. It's just there's there's not as many of us, and we tend to get diagnosed uh, later, uh, which is another um, weird uh I don't know what word I'm looking for, but it's it, it, it's a it's a differentiation um, in in the neurodiverse world. Okay, so you need to create a, a special recruiting script. All you need to do is take your usual run of the mill recruiting script and ask these you know six additional questions. What are their transportation requirements? What platforms do they use? Usually they have one preferred platform. Also uh, to note, people with disabilities tend to use older technology. Uh, one, because they tend to be, not always, uh, in lower socioeconomic circumstances. They are paid less. They are less likely to be employed. Therefore, they do not have the money to go out and buy you know, the latest iPhone 14 uh, the day it drops, typically. Um, also, because uh, when you see the tech stack, you know, you've got the browser and you've got the operating system and you've got the software and you've got the assistive technology, people with disabilities of any length of time, let's say three or four years or more, have gotten burned when one of those pieces changes and their entire platform just craters. So they don't like to upgrade because they don't like to work, move from a, a platform that they know that works to maybe a platform that's a little bit risky for them. And hey, what assistive technology do they use? What's their level of assistive te technology experience? What's the type of disability? What's the length of disability? All of these are going to be relevant uh, to how you decide to select your disabled participants uh, for your study. Okay, step three is you're going to send out email, right? And there are rules that you need to follow, the WCAG guidelines. Uh, six or seven of those 50 guidelines pertain to email. You want to make sure that the email contains a good description of what the email is about in the subject line. You want to make sure that it contains all your logistical information, easy to find, so your date and time, your location, and most importantly, your password. If you're doing remote um, access, you want to try to embed the password in the link so that somebody who's blind, for example, doesn't have to go fishing through that email to find that six-digit number that they then have to copy and paste into the Zoom, or do an unpassworded room but admit people when they join after you know, okay, this person's legit, um, I want them here, I'll go ahead and admit them. Uh, because sending people on a password phishing exercise is a good way to make them late uh, for the, the remote sessions. And then ask them, 
what accommodations can I give you? Do you need live captioning? Do you need certain levels of light? Uh, you know, uh, you don't have to go into the details of the accommodations. They know what accommodations they need, but what they want is they want you to ask so that they can tell you they don't want to have to raise their hand and say, oh, by the way, I need, I have these special needs um, because that's um, it's a little bit uncomfortable for us to, uh, to have to do that. It's, it's much easier when somebody asks first. And then trust me, we always have the answer. Okay, you're going to have a registration form. Uh, your registration form can, sorry, give me a second, something covered up my slide here, uh, helps you estimate the number of attendees. You can ask questions about the accommodations on a registration form. Uh, so this would be for a larger group event, uh, not necessarily individual interviews. Um, you can have uh, if you're gonna, if you're doing something where you're gonna send them a copy of the um, recording, you can, you'll have their email uh, to send them the materials. Uh, potentially sending them the materials in advance. We'll get to why that's a good idea in a minute. Um, participants uh, can ask questions in advance uh, through the registration form. But your registration form has to be accessible, and not every uh, registration platform uh, will work with all forms of assistive technology. So the ones we recommend are MS Forms, Google Forms, SurveyMonkey, or Accessible HTML. Those are the only four that are free that I know of that can be used by 100% of people with disabilities. If you've got Qualtrics, Qualtrics is very good as well, um, but obviously Qualtrics has to be licensed. And so not everybody has it, especially not at smaller companies. I think it's a little bit on the pricey side. Okay, uh, use the document accessibility checker built into uh, Word and PowerPoint. Uh, to vet your materials before you present them uh, to the users. So you can just type accessibility into help and it will bring up the accessibility checker. It works pretty much the same way on um, PowerPoint as it does on, on uh, Microsoft because obviously they're both office tools. And what the accessibility checker does is it helps you identify things like missing alternative text. So alternative text is what gets said to the screen reader user when it hits a graphic, okay? If the graphic is conveying something informational, then you have to have alternative text. If the graphic is just there to be pretty or funny or to break up a couple of blocks of text, then you flag it as decorative, and then the screen reader pretends that the, that the graphic just never existed. It skips over it. Um, the, uh, it will identify bad object flow. So uh, PowerPoint is kind of um, you know first in, first out, where if you drop objects in, uh, and then later you move them around, it will still, the flow to the to the slide behind the scenes is the order in which you drop the objects in. So you might have to reorganize those a little bit to make sure that the flow is good for somebody who's a screen reader user. If you've got bad color combinations, uh, Microsoft will flag that for you. You've used, you know, uh, you know, medium blue on a dark blue background. There's not enough contrast there that will get flagged. If you use silver on white, not enough contrast, that will get flagged, those kinds of things. And then also missing page numbers and missing page titles will get flagged on the PowerPoint side. Um, and those are very important because people who are blind again, uh, use search and use page numbers to make sure that they're on the page that they think that they're on. Okay, uh, if there are documents that are gonna be shared during the meeting, Offer people an accommodation to provide them in advance because sometimes people with disabilities want the time to like to read stuff on their own time. It's a little bit uncomfortable uh, to be reading things live while somebody's waiting for you to finish reading. And if they're uh, slower absorbers of information, they might want that. For somebody like me, uh, I use magnification because I have glaucoma. If I have the URL, I can zoom it on my screen and see it enlarged where all I'm seeing from your side is, is the tiny little things at your level of magnification. So um, this, these are things that you can do. Obviously, if the information isn't confidential, you'd want to do this after they sign the NDA. So there's a couple of logistical things uh, that you have to wrap around this. Uh, because if you are doing Zoom and you have an eye chart that looks like that, 
what I can do is I can, you know, quadruple it. This is 400%. Um, and that's what it looks like to me. I can read what's on the right. I don't think anybody, you know, can read past maybe line two or three uh, for what's on the left. So being able, being prepared to provide the information in advance, if it's possible, is, is going to help you avoid this and you're going to get better results. Okay, so if you're having a medium-sized group session, uh, you definitely want to take a digital uh, first approach to everything that you do. Um, you're going to want to know who your audience is, understand who uh, uses what type of assistive technology in advance to make sure that you check to make sure that all of that works correctly. Um, you're going to need to select a venue or a format. Are you going to do this in person? Are you going to do it on Zoom? Um, anything that you do during the meeting has to be accessible. So uh, examples of that, people use um, those word cloud builders all the time. I think the most popular one is Mentimeter. Mentimeter is not accessible. Um, Miro boards are not accessible. They're, both of them are on their way to accessibility, but today they're not accessible. So if you're going to, whatever activities that you're doing during the call, you need to make sure that those activities are accessible also. Um, you know, obviously, you want to verify that whatever platform you're on is accessible. For God's sakes, don't use WebEx. WebEx is the worst. Um, Zoom is pretty good. Um, and then, you know, through the registration form, uh, accommodate your audience needs. So ask them in advance, what can we do to make this an easier experience for you? And they will tell you. Now, if you're doing it in person, these are the facility considerations that you need. So we're still in the preparation stage. Um, so you need to make sure that you've got lots of space. Um, I use a wheelchair. You need areas uh, to turn around. You don't want rooms that are cluttered with furniture. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got your live streaming set up correctly so that if people are watching remotely that they can do that. The, um, the, the one-way glass doesn't work great for people with disabilities. It's it's a psychological issue because we've been traumatized by medical settings and medical settings frequently use one-way glass. And so we would recommend that if you've got outside people listening in, uh, do it through streaming. Uh, don't, don't do it through the, those one-way glass panels. Um, you know, comfy seating, uh, armless is good. You can see we've got a couple of chairs here with really low arms. That makes it possible for people with wheel, you know, wheelchair or mobility issues to transfer into those uh, if they want to. Um, then you've got your uh, eye tracking and focus technology and facial expression analysis. If you're using those, just be advised they don't work well on people who are neurodiverse. Um, because they have different eye patterns and different facial expression patterns. And it's just not, you're either going to have to separate it out and look at, uh, at both different uh, groups separately. Um, if you, if you put it in, it's all going to just it's all going to end up uh, coming out in averages and you're going to lose the, the input from, from each of those groups of people. So um, just keep that in mind. That's all. All right, uh, then you know, you've got your usual, uh, do the moderator instruction, purpose of the group, ground rules, introductory uh, questions, interview questions. There's not a lot um, new or magical about this. Um, we do recommend trying to follow uh, plain language guidelines. Understanding what the reading level of your audience is is important to make sure that the language that you're using is something that's consumable. Uh, by them. So uh, if you don't know the reading level of your audience, good average for the U.S. is eighth grade. I wouldn't go too much above that. Uh, and you can use, uh, there's a reading level calculator that's built into Word. So you can take all your scripts and plug them in there, and it will tell you how many years of education somebody would have to have in order to understand that script. If your audience is all cloud administrators, it's okay to go grade 14, grade 15. Most cloud administrators have uh, college uh, level experience, okay? If you're selling burgers, not so much. Uh, you, need to, you need to go with a lower level um, in order to, to meet that audience where they are. 
Okay, captions are absolutely 100% essential. It used to be that you had to do special stuff to set up the captions in advance in Word, and it was really a nuisance. Um, I beat up, uh, sorry, in I didn't mean in Word, I meant in Zoom. I beat up Zoom really hard, and uh, so they now set it up so that I can turn on the captions without anybody having said, hey, it's okay to turn on captions. It's automatic now, and it's in the um, control of the user. Hearing loss is the most common congenital medical condition. Hearing loss can also be acquired. You know, loud rock and roll exposure, uh, firearms exposure, explosions, all of those things infections, tumors, uh, they can all uh, create acquired hearing loss. Um, captions also help in noisy environments. It's actually about 80% of people who watch videos online who use captions don't have hearing loss, okay? They're one of these other reasons or the reasons why they use captions. So noisy environments, their, their kids are making noise or they're watching something at the gym. People are visual learners rather than auditory learners. They will learn faster and, con and consume better through captions rather than sound. English language learners benefit from captions. Uh, my son-in-law, uh, who is Middle Eastern, uh, we had karaoke at uh, their wedding because he said he learned to speak English from uh, 90s karaoke. And so they set up a 90s karaoke thing, which was kind of fun, but it's English. Uh, Wilmer Flores, who's a, a great... Uh, God, I'm going to get the position wrong. I think he's a shortstop uh, for the San Francisco Giants, uh, said he learned English from uh, watching Friends with captions turned on. And when the pandemic happened and they were putting all those cardboard people in the stands, Jennifer Aniston sent him a cardboard of her because uh, his walk-up music was the music to Friends. So uh, don't underestimate the needs of captions for English language learners. And then obviously, if you're captioning videos, um, again, you've got the conversion factor. So this is after uh, when you're turning something into a sale, not necessarily for user research. The caption videos, people hang with them longer, and they're more likely to buy at the end of the day. So don't just caption your real-time research sessions. Push your uh, product people to caption all your videos online because it's, it's going to help your company perform better. Okay, so on the Zoom call, again, you have to analyze every in-meeting activity for accessibility. If you're going to use Miro or Mentimeter, you need an alternate path. So, for example, I can't use Miro. So every time I go on a call at VMware that includes the use of Miro, I pair up with somebody and just private message them back and forth, and, and they take my Miro input and turn it into what goes on the board for me. So it's, it doesn't mean don't use these things ever. It means use these things with some thought so that you've got these alternatives set up for the people instead of them raising their hand in the middle of the group call saying, uh, I can't use Miro because uh, they we don't, we don't like having ourselves singled out uh, because of our disabilities. Okay, so host and moderator in terms of Zoom meeting interaction, you have to know how to use the spotlight and pinning features because you may have a sign language interpreter on your call. So don't flail around figuring it out while you're on the call, figure it out in advance of the call when you've got an interpreter. Um, you want to avoid sensory words like up, down, left, right, you know, directional stuff. Uh, during presentations, somebody who, who has dyslexia might not be able to follow those. Um, you want to make sure you mention people's names before you uh, go into details on something. Uh, if you've got captions turned on right now, what you will notice is uh, Zoom captions do not yet identify the speaker. Um, some captioning engines do. Uh, most at this point don't. Uh, the speech recognition isn't quite good enough for that yet. So uh, help saying who the speaker is will before you start talking will help somebody who's deaf follow along better and then obviously you know avoid inaccessible meeting activities if you've got good replacements because those can be frustrating experiences okay make sure you use the raise hand uh function 
so that people don't talk over each other because another thing that captioning engines don't do well is they don't do crosstalk well when two different people are talking at the same time. So not only does it not attribute who the speaker is, it will actually mix up the two sentences together because it can't figure out who's saying what. Uh, so group settings, obviously if it's a one-on-one -on -one interview, you don't have to worry about this, but for a group setting, you definitely want people to use the raise hand feature. Make sure you provide enough time for speakers. You don't want people with anxiety or people with a speech disorder to feel under pressure because that tends to make the, their, the symptoms of their disabilities worse. Remind people to turn off their cameras and microphones uh, if, if it isn't necessary for them to have them on. Um, and then if you're gonna have some type of voting thing, uh, make sure you've got multiple paths to voting. So the Zoom voting interface is great. If you use a voting interface where you're giving people a URL or a QR code, that's going to be more difficult. So you need to make sure that somebody who wants to vote can pass their vote on to somebody else who can put the vote in for them. Okay, so we've gotten through uh, most of the stuff that you have to worry about for the participant side. Then obviously you've got to do your data collection. Uh, which you're going to do uh, during the participation, that really isn't very much different with the exception, like I said, with the facial tracking and um, eye tracking software, definitely separate out your neurodiverse participants from your non-neurodiverse participants. Uh, you're going to write some type of report. Please make the report accessible. You never know who your consumer is going to be. It could be somebody who's colorblind. It could be somebody who's dyslexic. People with hidden disabilities in particular in the workplace frequently don't disclose. So uh, just use that accessibility checker that we talked about and you will be fine uh, for in terms of your report contents. Uh, then you're going to uh, present the report. And I love this cartoon. It says, uh, what if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? You know, this is all about change, right? So you need to identify and then prioritize the changes that the people with disabilities are requesting so that you can make your product a better experience for them. And then, you know, they're going to tell all their friends and that's a good thing. And then finally, you're going to, you may possibly circle back with your participants afterwards to participate in a survey. So the same rules apply to this as applied to the, um, the registration form that we talked about earlier. Use plain language, you know, talk about what the survey is about, how much it how much time it's going to take complete, use both narratives and numbers for rating scales. Something interesting that you'll find when you start doing a lot of research with people with disabilities is that they will say, I hated this, I hated this, I hated that, this could be better. Oh, but I'm going to get on a scale of one to seven, I'm going to give you a seven. Okay. The discongruity is because they may identify all kinds of things that they want different or they want fixed, but it also might be the best thing that they've ever seen. Largely because the web, as it currently stands, is 98% inaccessible. So if you're even just making the little bit of an effort, um, it, it's going to be better uh, than, than other experiences. So that's why you need to make sure that you've got uh, both the quantitative and the qualitative uh, data so that you can reconcile those two. Um, organize your survey content by using sections. People tend to uh, Especially if it's a long survey, they might want to take a break and go, you know, you don't want that all that survey time out, uh, survey data to time out, because if it does, I guarantee you they're not going to come back and do it again. Um, make sure you're using the right controls in your surveys, uh, check boxes for mul multiple answers, radio button for a single answer. Definitely want to do a practice run on the survey before sending it out widely. That's just common sense for any survey, not just for uh, when you have participants with disabilities. And then again, you want to make sure that you're choosing an accessible survey platform. So the five magic survey platforms are forms, again, forms. So Microsoft Forms, Google Forms, SurveyMonkey, Accessible HTML, and Qualtrics. I'm done. So um, happy to answer questions at this point. Oh my yeah, God, Sherry, there's 99 um, messages in the chat. I uh, hadn't been monitoring that. Okay. Sherry, we have been extracting the the, the questions. And Good, I'm glad somebody did. Them, uh, you know, show, <laughs> getting some of the ones that I think are, are more critical. So we'll just be able to read those to you. And if you're the one who asked the question, uh, feel free to speak up if you need to qualify that anymore. 
Uh, but thank you for this presentation. Uh, I, I got to retrace a lot of steps, a lot of these lessons I've learned the hard way over the years. Uh, and, and just to give everybody one other thing to think about, while you may not consider yourself in a disabled category now, Father Time is going to come and get your ass. Yeah, you. disability is the only DEI dimension that you are guaranteed to be part of it someday. I mean, unless you get struck by lightning in your 20s, it's going to happen. Yeah. As somebody who wears hearing aids now and has already been part of the macular degeneration set and beginning to have mobility issues because I used to be a jock, uh, it's all come back to live with me now. And I'm having to consider those as I continue to use technology, especially if I'm going to be in this industry. So uh, if, if, if you're feeling a little removed from it now, keep in mind it's coming. Uh, so we've got some great questions. And I'm going to start off here with one. And again, if this was your question, go ahead and jump in. Rather than asking the user to bring their hardware to an in-person test, would you recommend a remote test so that they can use their own tools in their own environment, or would Zoom be a barrier for them? I think Zoom adds an extra level of complexity. I would leave it up to the user with, with what they're more comfortable with. Some people with transportation issues might uh, rather do it at home, whereas uh, some people might rather come in and bring their own hardware. The more control you put into the user's hands to make decisions surrounding how the session is going to be conducted, the, the better off the users are going to be. Yeah. Okay. Next question. What can we say to engineering teams who want to go the lean UX model or who say it takes too long to design for accessibility during a sprint? If I can jump in on that one real quick, I would say do it today or get sued tomorrow. So uh, I'm, I'm sure Sherry can offer something a little more uh, 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 literate. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> I like that. Uh, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me how people who can't expense a $25 stapler without two signatures can make decisions that implicate millions of dollars in legal fees. Um, you know, the Harvard MIT lawsuit, we know how much that cost because that was public. The legal fees were $4 million. The Target lawsuit, which was the original granddaddy of all accessibility lawsuits in, I want to say 2006, was $6 million. Domino's just spent a fortune dragging something all the way uh, to the Supreme Court and losing. Um, so it's not just the legal costs, right? It's the opportunity costs, because guess what happens? Most of these cases don't go to trial. Most of these cases go to settlement agreements, and settlement agreements means the company agrees that the suit gets dropped in exchange for the company doing all this stuff. And all this stuff might include stopping everything and fixing, you know, 400 accessibility bugs before you move on to the next release, right? So, so there's, there's financial costs, um, there's opportunity costs, and um, it, and then there's brand damage. If the you know nobody wants to wake up in the morning, let's let's say you got a survey, right? Let's pick something simple, and you send out an inaccessible survey. Who wants to wake up in the morning listening to a radio station talking about how your company is not interested in input from blind employees? Because guess what? I actually had that happen to me, uh, where an outside company uh, who was a contractor did that under our brand name. Uh, so uh, there's, you know, it, it's back to the standard um, truism. There's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. If you don't do it right, you're guaranteed to do it over. Uh, when the speaking of the National Federation uh, of, of the Blind, as they just after they were flush from their court <laughs> win with Target, they stopped in on us at Travelocity. And one of the things I learned, and they keep reminding you, is that it the the organization doesn't have to take note. It only takes one person who is a member of National Federation of the Blind or who can contact National Federation of the Blind uh, to get uh, proceedings going. So uh, you don't have to wait for the whole group. One person can launch this and then NFB moved in with us for about two years until we were able to convince them that we were working in good faith and making the changes we needed to make. 
uh, and you know, holding a lawsuit over our head the whole time. So it's it's not a comfortable thing. Um, next question is if you have limited resources, and there's actually a lot that came in around this. If you have limited resource and access to users with disabilities, what resources can we leverage outside of cold calling via social media, online uh, for research participant recruitment? Okay, hang on one sec because I'm Googling something. Uh, my, my rule is if I've been asked the same question before more than twice, um, I, uh, I write an article on it. So um, I have an article that I wrote about doing accessibility, high impact accessibility on a budget. Ta-da, I found it. Um, probably need to update it because it's a couple of years old, um, but that's going to give you um, some ideas um, about how to do accessibility in general on a budget and not necessarily just research. Um, Recommendation specific for research, how to find participants. Well, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. The easiest way and the cheapest way is to align yourself with a, a, a nonprofit or a Facebook group or, or some group that's connected with the disability that you're, you're looking for. So if you, um, you know, if you're, if you want to research, if you want participants with glaucoma, you would go to the Glaucoma Research Foundation. They will find you participants with glaucoma. Um, if you want um, people with mobility challenges, if you go to any local um, center for independent living or the Dana and Christopher Reeve Foundation, if you're looking for people with who are quadriplegic and not necessarily just um, wheelchair users, uh, that that's a great group to work with. Um, there are specialty organizations who will find these people for you. Um, but that costs money. So if you want to find them for yourself, that, you know, going to those different organizations, because trust me, every disability that exists right now today has a Facebook group, probably has a dozen Facebook groups. Um, and uh, likewise on, and it probably also has a dozen um, nonprofits. Uh, so those, those are the places to go uh, to, to find those individuals. Something else too, which I think is kind of goes back into the root of the issue. Um, uh, I, I've worked with a company uh, in San Antonio, a group called Nobility. I was um, going to mention them next. Yeah. So run Nobility. by Sharon Rush, and they have been able to help us find panelists. But more importantly, they will bring you consultants who experience particular disabilities to help you build this stuff into your apps and, and, and things in the first place. They're the uh, one consulting comp accessibility consulting company in the U.S. that's actually a nonprofit, so I definitely recommend them. Uh, they also have a conference. I'm going to put it in the chat window, and then somebody can Google it faster than I can. I got my caps lock key on. Called Access U. I think it's kind of sort of in May every year. Uh, that's uh, I know somebody asked about conferences. Access U is, is one of the good conferences to go to. Um, that one you do have to pay for, but there are other conferences like um, AxCon, uh, which is uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, I believe. Um, and it's put on by one of the consulting companies called DQ. Uh, they uh, That one's free. Uh, and um, hey, Glad to hear you're going to AxCon. Um, but that um, that budget, um, I have another article called Advice for the Ex Aspiring Accessibility Tester. Um, that one's got a list of all of the conferences and all the certifications and which ones are free and which ones are paid for. Um, so uh, you can kind of uh, divide up what you look at uh, by your budget. Okay. And yeah, so there's there's a lot of places to reach out. More importantly, there's a lot of pay, places who want you to reach out and, and they'll extend themselves quite a bit uh, to help you out as long as you're, uh, you know, making the good faith effort to do the right thing. Um, um, one hashtag to follow coming up in the near future would be GAD 2023. Uh, GAD is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. It's the third, it's actually my daughter's birthday this year. So it's May 18th. Um, and um, a lot of organizations will be doing a good mix of webinars uh, that you can go to. Uh, and uh, usually they post recordings afterwards. So that's that's another uh, great way to, to find resources. Okay. Here's another good question. Any advice on how to figure out what prevalence there is of different disabilities within a user community while not running afoul 
of medical disclosure issues? It's actually a lot easier than you would think. The census uh, keeps a lot of um, pretty good information. So as, as long as you can give a specific diagnosis, like for example, if you ser search for prevalence of cerebral palsy, you will come up with a number for the population. If you search for the prevalence of cystic fibrosis or color blindness, you will, you will come up with those numbers. So, um, uh, the, can, can somebody search for the word aspiring and my last name, and you'll find that article, um, that the person in the chat window is, is asking for, um, all that information is pretty much out there. The one thing that you have to keep in mind is certain diagnoses are associated with, uh, how developed a country is, what their healthcare system is like and their socioeconomic status. So for example, we have a lot more people with cerebral palsy in the U S than outside of the U S, but we have a lot more premature births. A lot more IVF is going on. So, you know, multiple births and preterm births, low weight births. And so our rate of cerebral palsy is higher than, you know, say, I'm just going to pick a country out of a hat, Portugal. Um, I don't actually know what their rate is, but I'm, I'm pretty sure everything I've seen that is that uh, the rate in the U.S. and some of the other English speaking countries are, are higher than other countries. So you kind of have to apply those um, geographic uh, things in mind. Same thing with macular degeneration. A lot of macular de degeneration is related to age. If you're looking for statistics for, for a country where uh, the average life expectancy is 70, you're going to find lower rates of macular degeneration because the people aren't li living long enough to get macular degeneration. So think about that for the acquired uh, disabilities. Okay, and another one here about sampling size, uh, sample sizes. Uh, any advice on sample size and types of disabilities when more broadly recruiting people with disabilities for research? And I know that's <clears throat> often a, a bit of a, uh, of a tangle for people who are just trying to get situated to do the work, the right to do, uh, do the right thing in the work. When you start to run, it, the more disabilities you begin to research and look into, the more you run into uh, uh, things that counteract other things that you would do. So what you might do for people with a certain disability actually cause more of a problem for somebody with a different disability and accommodating them vice versa. And so trying to figure out where that uh, where that standard comes from. Debbie Cat provides a lot of that, uh, but uh, you're putting together your your panel. What's a good sample size? How do you find that? So first of all, and let me answer the question about the the counter the counteracting because that one's easy. When you put the control in the hands of the user, they're always going to get the result that's best for them. If you're making decisions for the user, if you're trying to say, well, we want to choose this font because it works for the most people. Well, why don't you just let people choose their own fonts, right? What's what's magical about Arial 12? nothing. Um, and some people might want to use one of the dyslexic weighted fonts and some people like the serifs. So um, any anytime you think that you might be excluding your users or a certain subset of users by making a decision, ask yourself the question, can I put this in the control of the users so that they can choose what they want for themselves? Um, and if the answer is yes, then always do that because that's going to be the better result. Yeah. With us, not for us. Um, in terms of sample size, um, you know, you're, there, there aren't really any hard and fast rules. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, take the number of, of non-disabled participants that you've got, make sure that at least you've got 20% uh, of that number as disabled participants. You may need more than 20% if you're trying to do a deep dive on vision or a deep dive on neurodiversity, because there's a lot of different things that you need to represent because of this spectrum. Remember, we've got acquired, we've got non-acquired. Uh, you may have mild vision loss, progressive vision loss, you know, congenital cataracts. There's just a whole bunch of different categories. Um, so I, d I don't have a lot of good advice on, on sample size, uh, just to, you know, make sure if, if you're doing, if your disabled participants are less than 20% of your non-disabled participants, you're doing it wrong. I just can't tell you when you're doing enough to do it right. Um, 
and I'll, I'll go back to something I was talking about before, the importance of getting it built in. Once you've done it, when you look at the, at, at the requirements for WCAG 2 or WCAG 3, because if you're designing for other countries, you're going to have to be hitting that standard. But once you, a lot of it is, is just good behavior. If you do these things, once you, once you know what they are and you build them into everything you do, it's really not hard. Uh, and, and, and the effects are so sweeping. Um, let's see, there's one down here. What if a researcher, him or herself, is suffering from such accessibility issues? In other words, uh, well, the examples listed here are mostly uh, neurodiversity issues, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, uh, or hearing loss. Um, not quite entirely sure what the question there is. If this is your question, could you join us here? And I mean, what, one of the things that I'll say is that uh, the one area that's really lacking in accessibility is user research tools. User research tools typically, you know, like Dovetail, uh, for example, and, and tool, tools of that ilk really aren't very accessible. So if you are a user researcher who needs to use assistive technology, you may actually find it difficult uh, to use some of those tools. Um, the other thing is we're not a big fan of the word suffering. Um, I know different cultures have different um, models of disability and approaches to, to language and stuff, but, um, you know, I use a wheelchair. I'm not wheelchair bound. Uh, those, you know, are, are very different things. So um, wa watch out for, uh, watch out just in general for language that portrays disability as a negative, because many of us acknowledge that we're disabled it's part of our identity but we don't see it as a negative i was going to call you a wheelchair pilot but i decided against it <laughs> like that one <laughs> i i hope my wheelchair never takes off to be honest with you that would that would be scary <laughs> you're still piloting it and you know the condition of your craft so, all right uh let's see what hurdles have you experienced as a disabled person in the design industry uh this person in particular says they're visually impaired and currently enrolled in a boot camp coming up on UX design and would love to get some honest feedback from somebody who also uses Zoom regularly. The, the number one thing that I hear that I have to counter that I've countered 50 times and it'll be, you know, 50 more next year is we don't have any disabled customers. You know, that's that's the number one fallacy of design uh, and the fact that designers do tend to skew younger in terms of of age. And so they they don't think about disabilities that can be acquired over time. Uh, so those those would be the two things um, that I think uh, I if I if I could wave a magic wand and remove one barrier, it would be the we don't have any disabled customers because that's just silly. <laughs> of yeah. course you have disabled customers. Um, or you don't have disabled customers because you're so inaccessible people aren't are choosing not to use you that, that you're they're choosing your competitors' products instead. Okay. Well uh that about wraps QA. Sherry, thanks again for your presentation. There was so much so much I mean I read really there. fast and even I couldn't keep up with the chat. So I'm sure that I didn't um I didn't get the, to them all, but uh, like I said, if you want to reach out to me uh, online, that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, I am not difficult to find. Okay, and so thank you also for the Q and A session, and for your, and for your availability. No problem. Appreciate the invitation. Thanks. Yeah. No hands. No one. Nobody wants to take the microphone for a little bit. No karaoke. No dad jokes. Nothing. Let's put it this way. So, ah, there we go. You lucked out because I was about to tell a dad joke. <laughs> I saved us all from a dad joke. <laughs> uh, I, I just what you wanted, got? I just wanted to comment really um, with regards to the whole um, social perception of disability about the way I look at it. I and and it's not to say um, I don't have it right. Um, I'm not omniscient or some age old sage. I might be age old, but I'm not a sage. <laughs> um, and it's that it's simply about different abilities. Um, people who may not have fine motor control, um, who may not see colors, who may not hear, 
may not see it all, may not understand the language, um, may not even understand why they're there uh, or you know, on an interface or, or using a particular product at a particular time. Um, it's all about just different levels of ability and trying to accommodate as many of as much of that as you can always. And I know I'm talking to the choir, but in, in trying to accommodate as many different people with as many different ab levels of ability only benefits everyone. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Something Sherry brought up in the talk that speaks a little bit to that, that I haven't, again, this is something that I'd always sort of understood intuitively, but never had anybody put words to it. When she was talking about the difference between working with people who have congenital disabilities versus people who uh, have acquired disabilities. And I, you know, I think the trap we fall into is that anytime you hear about a disability, you automatically compare it to what you're capable of doing. And you think, wow, if I couldn't do what I do and I had to do it this way, that would really suck. Well, if you were, if it's a congenital condition, you never knew the other way. And you don't compare it. This is what you got to work with and this is what you're doing. And you don't have this other thing to compare it to. And you really don't want to hear how bad it sucks from somebody who doesn't get where you are. Uh, and and I, thought that was, I thought that was really important, particularly when you're setting up research and setting up your programs and putting your guides together. Uh, you know, are you dealing with people who are, who have, uh, you know, congenital obstacles that they have accommodated and found ways to work with uh, versus people who've acquired things? You know, somebody might, like me, who needs the print to be a little bigger and the volume to be up a little more. Uh, <laughs> and don't ask me to text you back and forth because my fingers and thumbs just don't work like that. Uh, and that's all, that's all acquired. Um so thank you for that. Anybody else? We got about 13 minutes to go here, so we got some visiting time. If you don't, I'm gonna tell the dad joke. There we go. What you got, Maya? Yeah, I guess this is I don't know, maybe this is a question for the room, but we were talking about uh recruitment as something that can be really difficult. I know that I, the group of people that I've been working with is people who've applied for disability insurance for various reasons. So all people with disabilities of some kind, but not necessarily disabilities that affect their experience on the internet. Like some people have just, you know, had a, like a toe amputated or something. That's a real disability, but really has nothing to do with web accessibility as far as I know. So I guess my question is like how you, sort out like what's the most relevant to recruit for um i don't know if that question makes sense i've got experience here but i'm willing to bet there's people with a whole lot more here yeah anybody want to respond there were a lot of questions about about recruiting and how do you put a panel together and how do you divide or subdivide or distinguish uh to get the people to uh get the right people to test your stuff out um without uh making it look like uh we only want people who are missing their their left leg uh which is not a go crystal can you speak to that no she has something else so uh i'll go ahead um i you know i've worked with recruiting agencies we've had agencies of record that we could contact and say these are the attributes we need so if we needed a not necessarily uh, for accessibility, but if we needed a panel to represent, you know, cross section of, of ethnicities across the United States, um, you know, we could, and, and who had shopped at a particular place or used a particular product or things like that. And so we could build uh, a screener and they could provide us with the folks. And I, I don't know, I've never done one specifically for accessibility. Uh, and I don't know if they could help, but again, those people are all pre-screened. And so you don't have to ask them uh, because they've already offered that information up to be available for testing. And uh, as I mentioned, Nobility uh, is a great place to just go to nobility. I think it's dot com. Um, it's a tremendous compendium of information. There's there's lots of stuff to read, stuff to see. They have their conference every year, but at the same time, they they help connect people with disabilities to projects like ours. 
to consult while we're building them, but at the same time also to participate and test things out. Uh, so that's a great way. That's a great place to look. Um, anybody else have anything they they borrowed from? Crystal said she doesn't. Kelly, do you? I don't have as much experience um, with recruitment. Um, only in in terms of, I'll just give it as a hypothetical. I'm on a project team and we're designing um, or redesigning a some kind of process online. Um, when it comes to who should we recruit for, uh, it, it, it's contextual. It depends on the the product. Um, mm. If the product is, let's say the pro the end product is a bicycle, but we're trying to fix the online acquisition process. You, you can apply for and buy a bicycle online. Um, when it comes to testing on that application, actually, that's why hers was such a good question because yeah. you don't really, you can't say, oh, well, we're just not gonna worry about people who can't see, or no, we don't have to worry about people with no left toe. Well, in a general sense, in a general sense, if you're just trying to meet WCAG standards, that can kind of help you figure out, you know, okay, we need to be thinking about, uh, uh, you know, thinking about the deaf, making sure that we have, you know, good, good uh, subtitling and, and things like that. Uh, thinking about the blind to make sure that we've got the proper alt tags in like that. Uh, and so you can approach that in a general sense. And that kind of tells you who you're going to want to have, uh, uh, you know, reviewing your stuff because they're the ones that are going to help you just meet the requirements. Yeah. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, they're, if you're doing something that's a little bit more specific and the more prescriptive the work is, mm -hmm. you're going to have to sit down. But it's always, again, better to sit down with somebody who is more uh, more aware of the things that people are doing out there uh, because they may disavow you the bicycle. Okay, okay. Well, you know we don't we don't need blind people. Well, that's bullshit. Um, not only that, and they could also be blind and buying a bike for their kid. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's you're going to find an a, a, an opposition when you start to set out and say, oh, we don't need to worry about them or worry about them. You can, if you dig a little bit, you're going to find out that you really do. Exactly. So uh, Crystal's had her hand up. Crystal, what you got to tell us? I guess it's more of a curiosity that came out of um, one of the breakout rooms. And we were talking about um, under like a, a software product that was being developed for um, low vision users, it sounded like. And it would be an app as well. And the question was, or I guess the curiosity was, is there a way for people to know if they're accessing a site or an app using a screen reader? Because from our discussion, it doesn't seem like there was, which is kind of baffling considering how much other information you can get. Having actually sort of seen thing. this, having actually seen this in practice and anybody else is happy, happy to have you jump in. I don't want this to be the Adam session. Um, well, Having seen this in even... practice, though, uh, these these folks are you know they're very skilled with with the technologies that they use. And she was talking about how people who are using assist, uh, using readers usually have it amped up to this speed level. It's just you can't make anything out of it. But they because they listen all the time, they can listen to it at a really really fast rate and 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 make sense of it that we can't. Uh, they know when they get into an app, really, from the, the moment they get in there, as it starts to break down headers and footers and navigation, things like that, they're going to know it real quickly if that thing has been built with accessibility in mind. Yeah, but I think the, I guess it's more how do, the, um, how do the people on the software and like the product side know that the users are using screen readers? Like that's they aren't the WCAG, able. That's where the WCAG standards come in. Okay. Those, the, the they, WCAC 2 they, is what we have to hit in the United States if, if the public is using 
anything that you provide. WCAC three gets you into Canada and other countries. Yes. But somebody got something? Yeah, I was just going to clarify. If you're asking about like the analytics, like seeing how yes. like the number of visitors to your site that are using screen readers. Yeah. Yeah. They. Yeah, that was the question. It's like, how do you do that? Uh, it doesn't seem like there are analytics to tell you that your users are using that. Um, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to hear Chris, Chris's answer. Oh, I was going to say that, um, well, hopefully in time to come that we'll have richer analytics for that. But I was going to say, I thought um, you were wondering if they were using a, a, um, a screen reader on an app versus desktop. I don't know if that was your question or not, but I mean, they do say that uh, many people, you know, it's a cross device experience that needs to be seamless. So whether more people do it on an app or not, you still need to, you know, have it um, responsibly designed so that they can, you know, whatever part of the process they can do on any device. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to say further to Kelly's um, point about maybe it was, Oh, actually, further to what Adam said about like a uh, percentage of your sample size, does that should that represent what um, the percentage of people with disabilities in whatever region that you are targeting or you know curious about? Like um, that made me think of well, then should our ethnic um, like percentage of people should that match? like that, you know, 15% of the population should be of this ethnicity or that ethnicity. I don't know if um, anyone has any thoughts on that. And um, wait, there's one thing I wanted to say about, Kelly, you were mentioning, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank right now. Mm -hmm. What did you? Well, in the moment, um, I can answer Chris, is it Chris Crystal. Crystal, Crystal, yeah. Um, to the best of my understanding, the answer to your question is no, um, and the reason is technical. Um, the The screen reader or whatever the device is that reads for the the user has to exist in a different in a different level. Um, so the 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 web page web interface exists in a browser. Um, apps exist in their own little container, whether that container is on the computer or on your phone or on a tablet, but the screen reader has to exist outside of that, and it must use whatever um, WCAD or what other, what other technologies, um, APIs more or less, to communicate with the screen reader, um, and, that, and that's why so many interfaces just don't just fail when it comes to a screen reader because they aren't using the APIs properly. They aren't using WCAD. They aren't using the, the, the correct markup. Um, so the screen reader interfaces with, with that next level, with that next layer, and it can't get any information back. By the same token, that layer, whether it's an app or a, a, a web page or, or anything, it can't know what is accessing it so the web page knows the browser the web page knows the computer knows the ip address it knows everything about the interface that's connecting to it but the thing that connects to to that interface it doesn't know anything about it it doesn't know that the web page doesn't know i wear glasses um or it doesn't know that i have to turn the volume up really high or it doesn't know that I have to make the font size bigger. Well, I mean, they could if they wanted to, but they typically don't. Um, so unfortunately, it's a complex problem trying to get analytics on the percentage of your audience that is using any assistive device. And there's more than just screen readers. There's all kinds of complicated things out there that would blow your mind. Um, to, so to go back to Chris's, Chris Tang, what, what you were positing, you know that you're you're stepping into that space that when you're sitting down to do put together a, a research plan um, and putting together your test guide for a, a panel that you envision setting up, uh, there are and we're discovering even more now there are so many different different facets 
that you can consider. And even just in just in accessibility, it becomes hard sometimes to figure out, okay, are we, you know, if, if we're doing these things for the people with motor impairments, we're screwing the people over who, you know, can't see. Uh, and it's, I can think of no example of that. But um, there are times when you start, if you start trying to consider all the different disabilities out there, you are, you have to ask yourself, is what we're doing that divided in how it's going to be approached. So yeah, you you got to look at a whole bunch of things. When you're looking at 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 race, uh, a friend of mine is putting together a program specifically for trauma information for how trauma informs how different people approach certain things, uh, and that is again another layer. And so sometimes you have to sort of back it up to what you're working on. And again, WCAG lays out, okay, you're going to cover most of the people, you know, with if, if, you, if you satisfy these requirements. Um, but if you're getting into, maybe, you're, maybe your app is purely local. And so you might want to look at what's the different, you know, what's the different spread here in town as, or in this state, or as opposed to across the country or across the world. And so... You basically, you got a whole bunch of things you could check off there. We say, okay, what are we going to account for? And unfortunately, one of the reasons that people are accounting for accessibility so much is because they can sue your ass. And countries don't like, companies usually don't like that. But I have had some, in spite of uh, very deep and example-written uh, exhortation to include it, have said, no, we're not going to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. We're not going to do it. Okay, dude. Well, I think it also then opens up a slippery slope of, well, if we're going to have in our sample, you know, a percentage of, of these ethnicities that represent the overall population, then are we going to also then have, you know, these economic groups that represent that region? And then, you know, that's income level, you know, household size, like the whole, you know, all those demographic things. And it's kind of, I guess, you know, it's, something you need to prioritize or just, you know, see, you know, how basically though, I, I just think that just for, you know, representation and um, making sure that you have enough of a cross section to, to uncover um, pain points that may not affect uh, perhaps the majority of your sample size, but to Kelly's point, you know, like 20% of your users is still a lot. Like that could that could be the same as you know twenty percent of your users live in say this state. Well, if if you know when people say, well, that doesn't seem like a big deal that there's you know I don't know whatever percentage that don't have a left toe. Well, if you're saying, oh, we're not going to um, make our product accessible to people that live in this state, Arizona, say for example, that's you know that's not legal number one, and that's discriminatory. So. I think you know you can make the business case that you are you know leaving money on the table or you're missing a lot of opportunity if you are marketing it to everyone you're spending the marketing dollars on this but yet 20% can't you know access your product fully yeah. maybe at all or maybe they get through you know halfway of the process and they can't like check out or do the call of call to action that is going you know yeah. to be mean success for you and the thing about it is everything you're saying is pretty irrefutable uh however and this is going to sound jaded um when you're dealing with product managers and leadership and particularly people who are holding the purse strings um we're talking about a long game they can't see past their feet right now usually because of the money and the time limits they're focused on that. And frankly, if it's not on fire and their pants are catching, they're not going to worry about it. And so you're talking about something that's going to happen when you talk to them about something that's going to be important after the launch or something that's going to be important, you know, to make the launch go better. They don't care. Just go fast, do it, get it done. Uh, so you're, you're not really dealing with people in their right mind because that's true. Really, you back it up. You back it up across all of UX and the need for design. 
uh, there's there's a reason why we wind up on the curb because bad design doesn't make doesn't doesn't start to bite you in the butt until way after the launch. It's the same with accessibility. When you're trying to tell, you know, every argument you gave is is absolutely 100% on target. But the problem is that you run into the people who are thinking that's way past where I'm even thinking right now. Uh, I think if you make it personal, though, like you say, you know, you're in a meeting, how many people um, know somebody who's on the spectrum? How many people have an older relative who can't read things unless they have their reading glasses on or, uh, you know, it, and like, you know, really making them think like, oh, actually, I do know someone like that. And, and maybe so that they can have more empathy and then say like, oh, you're right. That's not really fair that. And that you know, is a good method, but you got to get the right person. Uh, I tend to be a little more. Uh, of a pain in the ass, I said, "Oh, you don't want you don't want us to do these things. Would you sign this saying that you explicitly said you don't want to do this, so that when they come after you, we'll be indemnified?" Um, that 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 gets it in there at times. Um, somebody was asking a question about WCAG. Um, that was something that Sherry mentioned earlier in her presentation. WCAG are uh, uh, a set of guidelines that are used for, initially they were applied to anybody who was doing government work, but then it began to apply to the public at large. If you're doing an app that's out there for the public, you have to make accessibility uh, affordances in what you're building so that people with disabilities can use this app, not another app just for them, but this app in the way they need to that suits the, the situations that they're in. And there are very various levels. WCAG or WCAG or WCAG is what I've usually called it. Two uh, kind of has a different sets of elements that you have to pay attention to like alt tags and uh, color use and uh, 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 contrast and things like that. It's not really a very long list, but these are things that if you build them in from the start, are going to satisfy these requirements. Now, uh, the US is kind of light on that, but if you're building stuff that is going to be used in Canada or in many other countries, you have to find out what their WCAG requirements are. Or is it higher than two? And then get those lists. And they're all just sort of everything in WCAG 2 plus this, this, and this. And everything in WCAG 3 plus this, this, and this. So uh, that is, that's a standard that is out there. Um, I think, I don't know yet, but I think they were going to apply something to native mobile. That was sort of a thing going on is it was only required for the web. You didn't have to do it in native mobile, but now people are doing uh, uh, reactive designs so that or reflexive, reactive, reflexive um, designs that are basically web-based, which means they have to incorporate those those capabilities as well. And uh, it's all written up. If they haven't passed, if they haven't made it a law yet, they will. It's all laid out there for native mobile as well. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about WCAG. Okay, so we have gone over time here, but anybody who knows me knows that I can pour a drink and continue this into the wee hours. But I think we need to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, and the 19 of you that stuck around with us. Uh, you're either already off the screen or you're a glutton for punishment. I appreciate it. Uh, so we will see y'all next month, uh, hopefully, at the World IA Day presentation. Uh, Alexis McNutt Eunice is going to be talking about participatory, uh, participatory research and how that works. And then after that, we're going to have, uh, shortly after that, we'll have our, uh, our social where we'll do kind of what we're doing here, only we'll probably, they'll probably have some games and things figured out. Uh, but it's a good time to pour your own drink and, and, and enjoy that. So hopefully we'll see y'all there. Again, my name is Adam Polanski. I appreciate y'all coming out. And I want to thank Nicole also for kind of working, working the switches in the background uh, and, and covering the things I missed. So uh, thanks, Nicole, and have a great night, all of you. Thanks, Adam. Bye-bye. Thank you.